is the entrance to the real ice cave. It's freezing up here. Keep that brake down there by your hip. So I pulled the I pulled the rope, and at that point we were committed. I look at the exit of this hole, and honestly, I could not imagine how I was going to get my body through there. And as I did, I got fully stuck. The ropes are probably 15 feet up in the air. Every time you would reach up there and grab, your hand would slip right off. Hello, hello, is anybody there? And if anybody's in the cave, they've got to hear this. And it was just the cave playing tricks on us. Nothing we could find to just get a fire started. I had ripped out some of my hair to just get the lighter going. <laughs> What if they don't make it in time? Or they're just gonna be dragging out dead bodies. Put all my weight on it to take my next step up and fell. She was heading straight for that hole that we just climbed up. If we don't get out of here within the next eight hours, we probably won't survive this. I'm Spencer Christiansen. Enjoy the outdoors. I'm married to Jessica, and we have a daughter, Aurora. I am Jessica. We do just about everything. Rock climbing, kayaking, lots of hiking, swimming, any sort of adventure that we can get our hands on, we go for. So I heard about the Darby Wind Cave and Ice Cave. I just started researching it, trying to look it up, and the very little information I found was really intriguing. And it, was, it wasn't too long, a lot of ice, it was really deep, and you had to do a lot of rappelling, and you know, you had to have all your equipment, so I was, I was intrigued off the bat. And that's probably what got me, is that it was gonna be a good adventure, but it wasn't gonna be anything crazy that we haven't done before. I just stressed to my parents where we were going. We met them for lunch, dropped off Aurora with them, I also let her know that we were going alone this time. It's incredibly important to have a plan when you're doing anything that's considered extreme or dangerous. It's very important to cover your bases as far as letting people know when you're going in and letting people know when you plan on coming out. Having a plan can be the difference between life or death. Jess told her mom that, hey, if you haven't heard us or heard from us by midnight, to call the authorities, call search and rescue, call somebody because something's gone wrong. And we had a night up here, we had a date night, and then woke up the next morning and headed up to the mountain. And it's about a two hour drive from where we live to the cave, and then five mile hike up to the cave. So we got there about seven in the morning, had to unload all of our stuff, pack our packs, make sure everything was secure. When we reviewed the information online, it made it seem as if it was about seven miles up the hill. In actuality, we were up there within two hours. It didn't take us very long to hike it. We actually passed about four or five different groups that were hiking up there. It's a very common hike a lot of people go through there. They go to see the wind cave, which is the exit of the cave we were headed to. The cave entrance was behind a ginormous boulder. It's hidden. It's a very hidden entrance. And so you couldn't really see the entrance until you're right there in front of it. By the time Spencer and Jessica reach the cave entrance, it's close to noon. Here's the entrance to the real ice cave. It's freezing up here. We were already tired, we are already worn out, and we're hungry at this point, so we actually decided we're gonna stop, we're gonna take a break, we're gonna eat our lunch, and kind of take a look around and kind of decide what we really wanted to do. Took a couple energy shots to try to get through and explore just the mouth of the cave. I was questioning it at that point, definitely. It was probably 85 degrees outside, and as soon as you stepped in, it was probably 30 degrees just walking in that cave. And there's constant ice cold wind coming at your face. But it was beautiful, but 
I was still shaken. So we walked back out and digested a little bit more and Spencer talked me into it. And then we decided to put on our gear and our coat and everything and we headed in. The cave entrance is huge. And at that point I was really excited. Basically it's a frozen river underneath the ground here through the cave that descends into three different levels. We just couldn't believe how gorgeous this cave was as we we're going through on ice. And we get to the first rappel. The first rappel is a steeper slant down of this ice slide. We knew that if we're gonna go down the first rappel, that was our commitment for going through this cave because it would be a lot of work to get back up. So we stopped actually right before we did the first rappel and talked it over a little bit. Can't believe how big this cave is. Going down to the first rappel. Should I kneel down? Yeah, I would just put your back to the rappel and then scoot down on, the, on your on your butt. Yep, just like that. And then remember, lock up the rappel, lock your brake up first. Now just slowly let the brake go, let your knees get wet. Freaking nice. You got it. As Jessica and Spencer descend the first rappel, the ice and grade of the slope means there's no going back. In doing this, they know they're being forced to explore the rest of the cave, no matter what obstacles lay ahead. And the first one's just small. You kind of just sit on your feet and just grab the walls and safely go down. It doesn't have a bolt. So I was the first one to go down. I felt more comfortable being the first person rather than the last, just in case something happened. I knew Spencer was strong enough to be able to pull me back up. It's kind of our mutual agreement because one, I can watch her equipment. I, I've been rock climbing a lot longer than she. And so every time that we hook her up into the equipment, I go over her carabiners, her ATCs, and how she's gonna be set up for the rappel, if the rope's twisted or not, that kind of thing. So I always help her and that helps her feel more confident in the rappel. So we slid down the first one, and before we pulled the rope, we looked at each other, are we willing to commit? Are we gonna do this? Then we decided, yeah, let's keep going. This is gonna be fun. So I pulled the I pulled the rope, and at that point, we were committed. And then came the second rappel. The second rappel is exactly the same thing, just a lot steeper and a lot longer. It's probably about uh, 30 to 40 feet, and it's just a big waterfall underneath the ground. The next one is really big, and you, use the bolt and rope up and go down. And then the next one is even bigger. You're taken back by the beauty more than you are the fear, I guess. There's no markings or anything that we're following in here besides bolts. The only way we really had a lot of confidence through the, through the cave was the wind direction and the airflow. So as long as the wind was on our face, we knew that we were going the right direction. And we finally found one place that had some marking on it. We find a little, just a tiny little hole. Around this hole in the wall, there was a bunch of writing and one arrow. It was a pink arrow that was pointing straight down there. So we knew, okay, well, here's our entrance. We decided we're gonna go all the way through. She was gonna go first. She pushed her set of equipment and herself through first, and then she radioed to me to keep coming. So I took my backpack and I pushed it in front of me. The tunnel gets so narrow you go from on your hands and knees to on your hands and chest and, and stomach. And then you have to have your arms up next to your face and you're scooting along, pushing your equipment and then scooting and then pushing and scooting. It's really extremely tight. So I call out, hey baby, hey Jess, are you there? And she's close enough to where she can see my backpack. So what she does, she reaches in, grabs a backpack. And this is the most intense part for me because I look at the exit of this hole and honestly, I could not imagine how I was going to get my body through there. He is 5'11", 220 pound bodybuilder. So he's big and I have an okay time getting through this tight squeeze. It's a long tunnel. You're down scooting basically through there. And that's me. And I am not that big of a person. Spencer had to take all of his equipment off and I had to take it through. So I probably in the end went through that tunnel four times before Spencer decided he was gonna try to go through. 
my adrenaline was already rushing because I knew I couldn't go backward. So I took my helmet off. And that actually made me feel better too, kind of letting that air around my head. I gave her my helmet and uh, I just decided, okay, I'm just gonna kind of do whatever I can. I'm gonna squeeze my, my shoulders up in there and I'm gonna push as hard as I can. We're gonna get through it. And as I did, I got fully stuck. So I heard about the Darby Wind Cave and Ice Cave. So I just started researching it, trying to look it up. We do just about everything. Any sort of adventure that we can get our hands on, we go for it. We were going alone this time. If you haven't heard us or heard from us by midnight, call search and rescue, call somebody because something's gone wrong. You couldn't really see the entrance until you were right there in front of it. Here's the entrance to the Radio Ice Cave. It's freezing up here. And as soon as you stepped in, it was probably 30 degrees, and there's constant ice cold wind coming at your face. I can't believe how big this cave is. Go down the first rappel. We knew that if we're going to go down the first rappel, that was our commitment. We're going through this cave. And we finally found one place that had some marking on it. We find a little, just a tiny little hole. We decided we're going to go all the way through. She was going to go first. It's a long tunnel. You're down scooting, basically. The tunnel gets so narrow. My adrenaline was already rushing because I knew I couldn't go backward. Push as hard as I can, we're going to get through it. And as I did, I got fully stuck. I, I was just almost in panic mode, but as soon as I felt the panic kick in, I grabbed onto the rocks around me, and, I, and even with my feet, and I pulled myself back into the tunnel. I told Jess, I, I can't get through there. I'm, I'm, you know, I was stuck. I was stuck for a good couple seconds. And so she was like, yes, you can, you can fit. We gotta figure out a way. So I tried it again, even though I was terrified of getting stuck again. I forced myself up in there. And I, again, I got stuck. So I pull out one more time and I said, baby, you gotta come down here and start digging or something. And these rocks are not loose rock. I remember her grabbing rocks and using one of the rocks to chisel away at other rocks. He backed up a little bit and I dug out with my hands as much of this dirt as I could get out, as many rocks. I probably moved stuff a half an inch, maybe. And at that point, that was all I needed because I pushed as hard as I could on my arms and on my legs and I scrolled through there and finally got it. But my arms were scraped up, my sides were scraped up because it was such a tight squeeze. And it took me a while to recover. I had to calm myself down. <laughs> and I really had to talk him through that one. He was very, very scared, almost panic attack at that point. Spencer and Jessica are now at the five hour point of their cave exploration. Reaching a waterfall, they decide to catch their breath for a moment and rest before continuing forward. The waterfall was gorgeous under there. The waterfall was beautiful. I mean, this is just some big waterfall underneath the ground. So we stopped, snapped a picture, kept on looking around the cave where we're gonna go next. But this is very narrow down there. So it was very obvious that the water had cut away through. So our decision was we're just gonna follow the river. After hours of being in this, you know, zigzagging around, trying not to step in the water, but that's impossible. You're walking through a river. Our feet were going numb, you know, so we're going through and we were really starting to get concerned how long this was taking. We look around for more, more clues. But at this point, we're questioning, have we gone too far? It didn't seem this long in videos. Spencer was only reading quarter of a mile out and we had been in there for hours, like past what we had thought we should have been. That was a major problem. All the information we received and all the information we looked up and even called about, it couldn't have been longer than just a couple miles. And we've traveled, and it felt like three miles through these zigzags. So we figured we've gotta be out soon. As the river flows to the right, starts turning to the right, the cave gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So it starts squeezing us down. And we're looking around, discussing back and forth, where the heck can the exit be? And I look up uh, around and I see a little crevice open up and there was something written on there in spray paint. I think it said P17, as I remember. It says P17. I was like, wow, okay, there's some, there is, there is physical proof. That's man writing something. No, we're going the right direction. This is good. We both start crawling toward this P-17 
And as we get squeezing through this little crevice, it opens up into a room where we can finally stand up. So we're excited. You know, we're excited. Yes, we found the next exit. We're on the right path. It's just basically a wet cave that is sitting in underneath another waterfall. It's bolted and it has two ropes leading up the waterfall. And seeing ropes, that was a good sign. I and mean, that was obvious that some, some people were down here at some point. And it was a hole and a, and, a, and a set of equipment to let you climb this thing. And as we did research before we went into the cave, one of the big things we kept finding was that there was probably about a 25 to 30 foot climb to get out of this cave. So we had just imagined, hey, well, this is the next way out. And there was, a, uh, there was another part in our research that we found called Crotch Lake. Crotch Lake was in descriptions on the internet and descriptions of or different articles was a, a piece of the cave where you had to wade through water up to your waist. Well, going through the river, we had done that three or four different times where the, where the river would kind of flatten out and you're going through a lake up to your waist. And so we had figured we had already passed Crotch Lake a long time ago. So this is actually pretty exciting because of how far we got. We thought, hey, this is the last little climb. This is the last little 25 foot climb. We're gonna get the heck out of here. The bolts with the two ropes of the waterfall had to be the way out. But the problem is the ropes are probably 15 feet up in the air. We can't reach them. And you're gonna have to lead climb. You're gonna have to pull up your own body weight. And this thing is probably 30 feet in the air before you ever reach the top of the waterfall. So you're constantly being soaked. It's freezing down there. We tried for probably two hours to pull ourselves just up to this rope with no luck. I would grab on and I'd try to reach the next rock to lead climb out. Oh, my fingers were numb. I couldn't pull myself up anymore. I mean, every time you would reach up there and grab, it's so mossy and frozen, your hand would slip right off. We looked at the rope and I noticed that my headlamp was starting to dim and flicker. As soon as I felt the panic kick in, I grabbed onto the rocks around me and I pulled myself back into the tunnel. I told Jess, I, I can't get through there. I'm, I'm, you know, I was stuck. And I dug out with my hands as much of this dirt as I could get out, as many rocks. I pushed as hard as I could on my arms and on my legs and I squoze through there and finally got it. He was very, very scared. And kind of kept on looking around the cave where we're gonna go next. After hours of being in this, our feet were going numb. At this point, we're questioning, have we gone too far? I see a little crevice open up. We both start crawling through this little crevice. It opens up into a room where we can finally stand up. It's just a, basically a wet cave that is sitting in underneath another waterfall. It has two ropes leading up the waterfall. We thought, hey, this is the last little climb. This is the last little 25 foot climb. We're gonna get the heck out of here. The ropes are probably 15 feet up in the air. We can't reach them. We tried for probably two hours to pull ourselves just up to this rope with no luck. I mean, every time you would reach up there and grab, your hand would slip right off. We looked at the rope and I noticed that my headlamp was starting to dim and flicker. Then we looked at the time, so it was midnight at that point. And I told my mom if I didn't call her by midnight that night, she needed to call search and rescue. I was a little bit worried because you didn't feel trapped or like there was no way out still at this point. So I felt bad that I was gonna worry my mom. She was gonna call search and rescue and we didn't even need help down there. So we tried to warm up and that just kind of felt like it depleted us more because we could feel how cold we were more at that point. I remember having all of our garbage burning and the flow of the smoke coming off of that wasn't going in a specific direction. So I remember Jess and I both walking around this cave a little bit more trying to figure out a definite route. I crawled on my hands and knees again to get to the water again because we remember seeing in the, in the dirt and in the sand a little bit, there was some finger marks. There was people there before at one point. So I was wanting to check that out gets questionable because rock comes right over your head and water comes up to your waist. So 
You can't see anything at this point. You don't know the water you're walking into. It's a really dark, long tunnel. Spencer walked in there a little ways and saw that the water just got higher and higher and the rock got lower until, I mean, he was up to his chest in water and we decided that couldn't be the way out. Our best option is up that route. That's the only way that really is obvious of a way out. The hole had a waterfall coming through it. It was a complete underhang. It wasn't a nice little straight wall and it wasn't anything that was gonna be nice to us. We tried a couple times of just seeing if we can get a handhold on the rock, but the rock is completely covered in mud and water, so we couldn't even get a really good hold on it. What we try to do is lead climbing. Even the first couple steps, it was impossible to get a good grip. And so I decided I was gonna lift her up on my shoulders. Maybe if I lift her up on my shoulders, you can grab on the rope and connect the carabiner in there somewhere to where we can get you kind of moving up. As soon as she grabbed the rope, she was spinning around in different directions and I was blamed for her trying to hold her steady, but she's hanging on free. So the longer she held onto this slick, wet rope, the more she's kept sliding down, the less that she could actually manipulate it. So it didn't work. We tried for probably two hours to pull ourselves just up to this rope with no luck. I would grab on and I'd try to reach the next rock to lead climb out. After trying a few more times, we were soaked. We decided my mom had to have called search and rescue by now. We couldn't pull ourselves up there. We didn't have enough energy. We were way too frozen. You had to weigh your options. Are we going to actually make it up here or are we going to put ourselves in hypothermia? Because at this point it was questionable. Our feet were numb, our fingertips were going numb. I remember checking the clock again and seeing three and four and five o'clock in the morning. So what we decided to do was try to start another fire, but we didn't have anything to burn except for our equipment. But at this point we're shaking, we're shivering, and we're completely soaking wet from all the different attempts trying to go up the hole. So we decided, well, it's better to burn some equipment than it is to be cold. So we dug into our backpacks and we pulled out my hat, Jess's hat, just whatever we could. We just wanted 45 minutes of sleep to try to get ourselves back together to try to climb up this waterfall again. Every time we would try to fall asleep, you would wake up because you were shivering. So cold that your feet are just burning. They're past the point of numb to just constant burning. Everything hurts. My fingertips just hurt to touch anything. I couldn't light the lighter. I couldn't open the protein bars. I couldn't do anything. Hypothermia would uh, include shivering, uh, then a lack of coordination, and then finally a loss of consciousness. There was even a time where I startled myself awake because I thought I heard country music down there. So it startled me awake and I was and I got up and I yelled, hey, is anybody down there with us? Is anybody down here yelling? And I was blaring the whistle and blaring the siren. And no, it was nobody. It was just the cave playing tricks on us. Uh, it felt like our body heat was drifting away from us every single time you drift off a little bit. So we didn't let ourselves fall asleep anymore. We had one really good instance where we snuggled a little bit, got warm, and then all of a sudden we both woke up way too cold and realized that's very dangerous. We're gonna fall into hypothermia, we can't let that happen. And so Jess decides, well, we're gonna have to survive somehow. Let's uh, get some movement going. We gotta move our body around and get some heat going. At this point, we had just decided this was a safe spot. So it was a marked area where we decided to stop. And I knew that if we were gonna wait for search and rescue, we needed to be somewhere that was marked. So after trying for hours and hours to climb out, and we just knew we were kind of better off waiting because we were still questioning if we had gone too far. I think it was five in the morning. No sleep because you're scared that one of you is gonna fall asleep and not wake back up because it's so, so cold. Spencer was pretty bad. He had traveled into that deep water that went clear up to his chest and there's just no getting dry. You can start a fire, but we don't have that much stuff to burn down there. We had a whistle on the backpack. I had my walkie talkie and we went to the most large part of the, of the cave that we were at and we would yell really loud, you know, hello, hello, is anybody there? And I would yell, I would push the alarm button on the walkie talkie and Jess would blow in the whistle three times to try to see if we can get some sort of reaction. If anybody's in the cave, they've got to hear this. Made as much noise as possible. We did this every 20 to 30 minutes for 
hours. Every time you'd sound that whistle and just hear no response coming back to you, you got a little bit more discouraged. We were shivering so bad at this point that we were gonna face our death or search and rescue was gonna come or we were gonna climb out. There were three options. We needed to make one more fire. We needed to get just a little more strength. There was nothing we could find to just get a fire started. I had ripped out some of my hair to just get the lighter going. <laughs> but I ripped out enough just to get a fire lit. And we talked it over. We said, if we don't get out of here within the next eight hours, we probably won't survive this. It's a race against time compared to staying in one spot, giving search and rescue an opportunity to get to us. So we both decided, are we gonna sit here and wait? What if they don't make it in time? Because if they don't make it in time, or they're just gonna be dragging out dead bodies. We decided we're gonna burn everything we have left, which was basically just a small pile of trash. We're gonna take off our shoes and get our feet warm and get our hands warm and eat the last of our food. We're gonna give it all we got and we're gonna get out of here. We can't wait any longer, we're gonna freeze to death. Here's the entrance to the real ice cave. It's freezing up here. We find a little hole, push as hard as I can, we're gonna get through it. And as I did, I got fully stuck. I dug out with my hands as much of this dirt as I could get out. I see a little crevice that opens up into a room where we can finally stand up. The ropes are probably 15 feet up in the air. We can't reach them. The water just got higher and higher. He was up to his chest in water and we decided that couldn't be the way out. Our best option is up that rope. That's the only way that really is obvious of the way out. Are we going to actually make it up here or are we going to put ourselves in hypothermia? It's better to burn some equipment than it is to be cold. Every time we would try to fall asleep, you would wake up because you were shivering. So cold that your feet are just burning. Hello, hello, is anybody there? And if anybody's in the cave, they've got to hear this. It was just the cave playing tricks on us. There was nothing we could find to just get a fire started. I had ripped out some of my hair to just get the lighter going. Are we gonna sit here and wait? What if they don't make it in time? Or they're just gonna be dragging out dead bodies? We're gonna give it all we got and we're gonna get out of here. We can't wait any longer, we're gonna freeze to death. I grabbed the equipment, I laid it all out, and I looked at another idea. I was trying to think of a different pulley system I could make, or we've got rope, We've got carabiners, we've got rock climbing equipment. We have to figure out something with our strength level that we can get the heck out of here. I think I have one last option that we can try. I boosted Jessica up. I kind of had her do a slip knot in this one, pull herself up, do a slip knot in the other rope, put her foot in there, stabilize herself, then pull herself up to make kind of a pulley system back and forth, back and forth. And that was the lay, and that was actually working. But the problem was she kept twisting back and forth, but I just told her, okay, hold still, and she was doing just fine. 45 minutes later, probably, after starting that, she got up there and uh, she made herself up through that hole. So that was exciting because we actually finally did what we couldn't do all night. It just took some smarts and a lot of strength. Jess was wiped out at that point. She was completely tired. The decision before we went up there was our last decision to make because it was this or nothing. I don't know how we're gonna survive any longer if this doesn't work. With Jessica up on the next level, it's Spencer's turn to climb. If they can both get up there, it seems they may just survive this experience. Spencer had to free climb as well, but he didn't have somebody down there with helping him with the pulley system, so he just had to use brute strength to get himself up there, but it's our last stretch. We don't have any other option at this point. You know, we're looking around and we're seeing nothing but just a circular room. Water, water is dripping over us. So we look up and we notice that we've got to, we probably have to go up. That's probably the way out. Spencer knew there was a, like a 20 foot climb on the way out. So we're thinking, this has got to be it. This is, we're just going to like crawl out of the ground here, basically. So I take the lead and I shimmy up this wall. The walls of this cave looked as if they were ancient clay. 
And I say that because there were actual um, seashells in the walls themselves. And you could kind of do the Spider-Man crawl thing. You put your hand on one side, hand on the other, and you just kind of shimmy up. Um, the, the problem was we couldn't use the equipment because there was no bolts. There was nothing that we could really use to, you know, hopefully stop a fall. Everything felt pretty sturdy. There was no more bolts in there, so we weren't sure. And you can't see any sort of light in there. All you see is this water. So we're trying to follow the water out. I'm probably 20 feet up, and I grab a piece of clay and seashells and felt pretty sturdy, put all my weight on it to take my next step up and fell down. And the whole shelf broke loose. The whole shelf came apart. She fell, she hit the other side of the other side of the wall, and uh, I see her, you know, in active fall, and it looked as if she was heading straight for that hole that we just climbed up, which was another 25 feet down there. And so I jumped out and, and actually caught her mid-fall, and I pulled her against the wall. She's injured. We're in a tight spot. We've got to get the heck out of here. <laughs> you know, this is this is beyond intense. This is this is something that you're you're both a, you're both afraid. But now you're getting angry at the same time because you've got to get this stuff figured out. You've you've done all the things that you're supposed to do, but also you're you know you're testing new theories. You're trying every little clue that could possibly give you to get out of there. I was very shaken at this point. I didn't want to go up any farther. I didn't want to do it anymore. I just wanted to wait it out. I was scared, and I had hit a rib and I hit my um, hands pretty hard. They were really scratched up. And, bleeding after that. So Spencer decided to take the lead. I'm gonna shimmy up, but I'm not gonna use these stinking ledges because they're not gonna really help. I'm just gonna put my feet on one side, the hands on the other, and just kind of scoot up. I remember looking straight up and seeing a very small opening. And so I remember peeking my head up there with my helmet on, peeking my head up there and with my headlamp, and it looked like it opened up. I was ecstatic. I'm like, yeah, it opens up. I'm yelling down at Jess, it opens up up here. It's going to be OK. She's down there hanging out because she's freezing cold and she just got hurt. So I was trying not to let her do too much hiking. But I said, hey, it opens up. Um, why don't you come up here, bring some equipment up here. I'm going to shimmy up this little tiny hole and we're going to get out. And she gets all the way up to me again. This is probably 75 feet realistically up in the air. So I squeeze through this really tight squeeze. It opens up just a little bit. And I was getting excited because it looked as if the waterfall was coming out of a tunnel, which might lead into another, to another route out. I get over there and I remember looking up and absolutely nothing. We've got rope, we've got carabiners, we've got rock climbing equipment. We have to figure out something with our strength levels that we can get the heck out of here. I think I have one last option that we can try. I kind of had her do a slip knot in this one, pull herself up, do a slip knot in the other rope, then pull herself up to make kind of a pulley system. 45 minutes later, probably, she made herself up through that hole. He didn't have somebody down there with helping him with the pulley system, so he just had to use brute strength. Spencer knew there was a like a 20-foot climb on the way out, so we're thinking, this has got to be it. And I grab a piece of clay and seashells, put all my weight on it to take my next step up and fell. It looked as if she was heading straight for that hole that we just climbed up. I jumped out and caught her mid-fall and I pulled her against the wall. So Spencer decided to take the lead. Put my feet on one side, the hands on the other, and just kind of scoot up. And it looked like it opened up. And she gets all the way up to me again. This is probably 75 feet. I'm going to shimmy up this little tiny hole and we're going to get out. And I remember looking up and absolutely nothing. The, the water was coming out of a tiny little crack. And I remember looking back and forth and I remember, you know, being completely in shock that there was nothing. And as I looked behind me, Jess had just crawled up through that tiny little squeeze that I had crawled up. There's no way out. We had worked our way up this tiny slit and I fell and got injured just to find no way out. So that's the point where we both got very scared. That's the first time I saw fear on Spencer's face, aside from the tight squeeze in the very beginning. We both were like, well, what are we going to do? 
I didn't panic, but I was like, I don't know what's gonna happen now, honestly. I literally didn't know of any possible way that we could survive that. So at this point we decided, well, let's get back down there. Let's climb back down. Let's get back into our little base camp or whatever you want to call it. Let's figure something else out to burn and hope that some sort of rescue comes because we can't find another way out of here. When you're down there, there's constant running water. So you think you hear people's voices and it's not, I'm not crazy. It's actually just all the water moving over the rocks. You think you hear music playing. It's so quiet down there and so dark. It's very deceiving. And so I think your body does what it has to do to be able to survive. So we thought we had heard voices. We both get down there and we're like, wait, 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 wait. So we tell each other, hold still. We couldn't really tell. So we both held, held our breath. I remember we both took deep breaths, held our breath. And yeah, we actually heard somebody yelling, hello, Spencer, Jessica. They actually said our names and we're like, and yeah, we freaked. We're like, yeah. I, mean, we, I remember we're blaring our, we're blaring our siren and we're blowing the whistle, we're yelling, yes, we're here, we're here. And ah, the big sense of relief at that point going, holy cow. We didn't know what we were gonna do. We had to figure something out because we were close to not having a way out. We were close to actually facing some death. And all of a sudden there was people down there. We start yelling back and forth and they're like, how the heck did you get up there? And search and rescue had to figure out how to get up to us to help us. There was no bolt to just belay down. So it was very scary and search and rescue had a really hard time. Search and Rescue's arrival gives the couple hope, but they're still cold and battered from their journey. They've got to make it out of the cave on their own strength. They didn't want to let us try to scoot down there because we couldn't feel our hands, we couldn't feel our toes, we couldn't feel our feet. And we were completely, at this point, we didn't know, but we were hypothermic. We were already hypothermic. I remember his name, his name's Phil. Came crawling up there. So he actually climbed the same rope that we climbed up, did the exact same pulley system that I did. One guy came up and he asked us who the president was and our names, gave us some food, gave us some heat packs. And he created with our rope an anchor because we had no way down, he had no way down. And he basically used my rope and wrapped around every little tiny outcrop of that circular room he possibly could. I was impressed at how he was doing it because this is a circular room. There was nothing obvious to grip. Um, but he went back and forth over and over again. And I even offered my help, but then I was so cold. He, you know, I was sitting there shivering, trying to get out of the water. He said, no, don't worry about it. Me and Spencer couldn't help him. We were so cold. We were hypothermic. We were sitting there just watching this guy wrap our rope around and around and around this huge boulder to try to get us to lay down. I went first actually down this time. I um, rappelled out of the hole first using his anchor. I zipped down that thing and that was the first time I was starting to feel relieved. I got down there, got my feet on the ground again and there was a bunch of guys down there. There was three guys down there at the bottom and they all cheered. They're like, yay, we got you down. And then Jess came down the exact same thing and then finally Phil came back out of the hole. You know, I, I asked them, I said, hey, how, where's the exit? Where are we going from here? I mean, are we in the wrong spot? Because I thought that was the way out. And they're like, no, you're only about halfway through the cave. It was happy, but it was really devastating to hear that because we had been in there for hours and we had moved a lot of distance. And they said, we gotta go through the water. And I was like, I, and I told them, I went in the water, there was no way out. And they said, no, this is Crotch Lake. I remember talking with them like, this can't be Crotch Lake. There, we To get out through there, we have to swim. And he's like, yeah, this is a little bit extra water for this time of year. So they even said, yeah, most people would never imagine going through that as an actual way out because it looks like it's just a dead end. And I, I now I stand by that because it was just a dead end and the airflow didn't make sense and nothing made sense to go through there. Search and Rescue said, we got you some dry clothes, but we've got quite a bit of ways through. They told us you can't have your dry clothes until we get through Crotch Lake, which 
was quite quite a ways we still had to go through. They kept getting us to eat more food, but it was really hard. Your body goes into survival mode and you almost get an upset stomach trying to eat. And then the next step was to go through the water. So we got back on our hands and knees, went right back into that water. But I was so cold and so happy to see those guys that the water felt warm, even though it was really cold. That to us obviously means that's hypothermia. We have to get out of this quick and we have another 25 feet to go in this glacier water. So I even said, okay, we've got to step this up a little bit. So we started moving faster. We finally get out. Uh, but at this point, the search and rescue guys said, hey, pull off to the right here. This is our next repel, but we're gonna give you the dry clothes now. I'm like, oh, thank goodness, here we go. Finally gonna get warm. They turned around, jumped in some warm clothes and started moving around and we started feeling our limbs again. And we got out of there, um, as I remember, 8.30 that night. It was good, but we also knew that we had a five mile hike down still but it was a huge relief. You don't realize how dark and trapped you are until you finally breathe fresh air. And it was so warm. We were in huge, heavy winter clothes and it was so warm outside and it was crazy to go from freezing to summer. And we started making our way down the hiking trail and they bust out a bunch of sandwiches. They have chips, they've got cookies, they've got water. And I just couldn't believe it. There's a ton of people it's a, it all of a sudden turned fun. The team lead for the search and rescue guy says that, oh, and we forgot it's your birthday. So the whole entire group, and I was completely embarrassed by this, but yeah, it was, it was amazing. Uh, they all sing happy birthday to me right there, pitch black, except for everybody's headlamps in a big circle, and we're eating chips and sandwiches. That was really cool. It was a great experience, but yeah, I was completely embarrassed, but it was, that made one heck of a good birthday, not to forget. Well, I won't forget that one. 